before Norris, Van Dam, or Segal, there was only one master. At only five foot seven and 140 pounds, he was a giant among men, a living legend. Famous around the world as the greatest martial artist of the 20th century. It's been over 20 years since his tragic death. He left a legacy that changed the world of martial arts and action films forever. There was a service in Hong Kong last week. 12,000 mourners, many of them weeping teenagers, jammed police barricades. Today's service was much quieter. The guests were admitted by invitation only, and there were only 200 of those sent out. A few fans without invitations showed up at the door, but they were quietly turned away. They waited in small clusters down the block. The invited guests were a mixture of Seattle's Chinese community and Hollywood. Both worlds were familiar to Lee. The leaders of the Hollywood contingent were Steve McQueen and James Coburn, Lee taught both men his special version of the martial arts at his school in Los Angeles. Thank you. May peace be with you. But beyond the myth, the rumors, and the headlines, what is the real story of Bruce Lee? What mysterious circumstances ended the life of this 32-year-old international superstar? Is there a possible connection between the death of Bruce Lee and the shocking death of his son Brandon some 20 years later? Bruce Lee is idolized around the world. His films still play in Paris, Athens, and Mexico City. He is revered in the Shaolin temples. A tribe in Malaysia worships him and believes he is still alive. Bruce really had uh, a number of personalities. I, I saw the public persona, which was a very uh, dedicated martial artist and very in tune to what his art was all about and the demands that it made on him. And he was willing to sacrifice for that. But there was another part of him that was a clown. His show name was Lei, Lei Siulong, which means little dragon. And believe me, during his short time, Bruce was the noise of his name. With all the accompanying, uh, say, drama and mythologies and the firecrackers that accompany uh, something like a dragon. And he was little every scene that he fought with a kind of a, uh, a martial art purity. And I don't think anybody has the kind of real grace that he had. I mean, he had an incredible grace.
I've been a film critic on and off for 20 years or more. I've seen hundreds, thousands of movies. But what set the Bruce Lee movies apart clearly was Bruce Lee. He jumped off the screen at you. When you sat in that theater, he was right there in your face. And there are very few actors who are able to achieve that. And there was a sincerity and an intensity that was so amazing that it was undeniable. And, and it made little kids jump on top of their seats and start screaming. It made women swoon. It made men excited that this was an action hero house. they could I mean, identify he's, with. His body was, was like, I mean, you could press him. It was like hitting into a piece of mahogany. I mean, it was... His, there was no give anywhere. He was steel. I, mean, I kind of saw Bruce, Bruce as a renegade Taoist priest. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he was not uh, by any means somebody who was going to um, be a traditional uh, follower, but uh, he was into spirituality. He believed seriously in right and wrong, and uh, he had his own ideas of what that was about, and um, it was heavily influenced by Taoism. He, he was, but um, you couldn't put him in that little box. He, he was beyond all he was of that. The, the, first, the last time I saw him, he was in the, this 23-year-old body with that shining, glowing, velvet skin. He was just, every muscle was in a perfect condition. I mean, he was uh, like... He could leap 20 feet in the air and could stick on the wall and come down. He was at total, he was, he was at the peak of his physical condition. He really was what he said he was. He was a great martial artist. And that, the martial art to him was like a religion. Intense as as is the only, that was the first word that comes to mind. I mean, Bruce had uh, focus. He could focus himself at any one thing that he was doing more totally than anybody I've that... ever met in my life. For the first time, there was a picture of a person who was Chinese that wasn't a Chinaman that had a, a cue, you know, that was always bowing, that was always subservient. Here, for the first time, was a Superman, a hero. So clearly there were people who felt that Bruce Lee was a loudmouth, a uh, interloper, uh, somebody who was very brash. Even now, for a lot of people in the traditional Chinese community, he represents more somebody they kind of don't want to identify with than somebody that they're really proud of. It's been over 20 years since he uh, died, and he's still a legend. People still want to hear about him. That's why, you know, you're doing this documentary, because people are still interested in Bruce Lee. And uh, that's very unique. There's not many individuals that they are able to be remembered years and years after they pass away. Elvis uh, Presley, James Dean, just outside. Yeah. He completed himself outside. I don't see how he could have, he couldn't have been any better outside. I, it was better than anybody outside. But he had that trip to go on the inside. Maybe that's what he's doing now, I don't know. But that's, uh, uh, it's an esoteric journey. It's the journey of discovery, of self, of, uh, of, of relationships. And it is. It's a scientific, esoteric, uh, extraordinary, fantastic journey. And uh, Bruce achieved almost all of it. Almost all of it. November 27, 1940, the year of the dragon. 
Li Hoi Chun, a popular Chinese opera star, is on tour in San Francisco. His wife Grace gives birth to their third child. His name is Li Jun Fun. A nurse puts an American name on his birth certificate, Bruce Lee. My father started off as an all-around actor, you know, because he was young. Then, you know, when Bruce got older and he got older, then he turned into being a comic. My father was actually the top four um, opera comic in, in, in China in his era. When Bruce was born, actually about three weeks after he was born, my father got him involved in a movie, in, in, in the United States, actually, a Chinese movie. While my father was performing in Hong Kong and in China when Bruce was young, Bruce was, would always be on the, you know, on the set or on stage with him you know, while they're rehearsing. So Bruce has an eye, you know, he's, he's got a very good eye for picking up stuff. My father was a very traditional Chinese person. He would constantly be in his own room. If you want to talk to him, you have to knock on the door. He would say, come in, then you talk to him. He was like the emperor of the house. His, his father ate opium, he was an opium eater, and he had his opium, his pipe, every, uh, every day for as long as uh, uh, he, was a, he was a comic. The Chinese, the upper class Chinese, all of them, uh, uh, Persians as well, I guess, and a lot of the, uh, where the opium is grown, they have a pipe of it a day. By the time he is 18, Lee has appeared in over 20 films. In The Orphan, he played a troubled teenager, a role which paralleled his own adolescent difficulties. Here is rare early footage of Bruce Lee playing a street urchin. You want some more? I took your shoe shine box to get you here for a square off. Now you know I mean business. How did Bruce first become interested in martial arts? For years, he had watched his father practice Tai Chi Chuan, but Lee wasn't seriously interested until he was beat up in a street fight. He asked Yip Man, the head of the Wing Chun clan, to teach him how to defend himself. Lee showed a real aptitude and began training seriously. The Bruce that I first knew when I was growing up was a very uh, unconcentrated person. But then after he started learning martial arts at the age of 14, his concentration built up. But then, unfortunately, it was geared more towards the martial arts area and still not in the study, studies area. In other words, he sunk all know, of his time into Wing Chun so training because he saw that as the best style that he'd ever seen well, relative he, to remember, street fighting uh, or for being able to, to beat the other. Be involved in like a couple of fights a day. Bruce would be dressed up in like, you know, the real Chinese traditional, you know, and he was like a kid. I mean, he was a teenager. And people, of course, will, you know, stare, you know. And when people start staring, Bruce will say, what are you staring? I think, uh, a lot of the um, wrong with rooftop battles that he witnessed in Hong Kong uh, really affected his whole ethic of what the martial arts should be about. You know, at one point he was just a, a, a tough Chinese kid on the street of, uh, of Hong Kong. He, he could have gone that way. He, his family uh, didn't uh, let that happen, but uh, the possibility was certainly there. Well, unfortunately, fighting was against the law in Hong Kong. And Bruce came from a fairly wealthy family. And his parents were very, very concerned that he was going to bring dis dishonor to the family with these fights and this trouble that he was getting into. His parents decided this was a perfect time for him to be able to get away from all these problems in Hong Kong, so they shipped him out and, and sent him over here to stay with Ruby Chow, the, the family friend. I remember my father saying, he said, all he's got now is $100 U.S. in his pocket, and I hope he makes it. Bruce's mother and father made arrangements for Bruce to come to Seattle to, to live and go to school. He was to get uh, through with his, uh, get his high school diploma, and um, while living uh, with my family, he worked in the restaurant, uh, first as a busboy and a waiter. And he didn't uh, cotton to that very well. It wasn't, uh, especially coming from his particular station in life where there were servants and maids. To get away from the restaurant business, Lee opens a kung fu school and charges for lessons, an unheard of practice among Asians. He gives his unique style his Chinese birth name, Jun Fan. 
the initial group were basically fighters and were kind of, in, in a way, street punks. Uh, I boxed and wrestled and et cetera, and did a lot of fighting on the street. And I thought, oh boy, this is, uh, you know, it was about as what, you know, about as billed in the article that I'd read. He was trying to marry Gung Fu, his fighting ability, with some kind of philosophical uh, direction. So he used to read a lot of books, he used to find out anything he could about the old styles. But after a while, he became disillusioned. He began to suspect that the answers were not in the old styles. Well, the first group was, looked kind of like the United Nations. There were Japanese guys, Chinese guys, black guys, white guys, Hispanic guys. He didn't really care about that sort of stuff. In 1964, Lee marries one of his students, Linda Emery, and moves to Oakland, California. In Oakland, the Chinese martial arts community were upset with him. Not they, they used the excuse of, well, you're teaching the foreigners. Had a, uh, it was very in-house. Uh, the Chinese only taught to Chinese, and, and uh, it was very uh, secretive students. the way they did things. It was very because Chinese important. at that time would not even teach another Oriental because they wanted the art strictly for Chinese. And Bruce, because he, was, he grew up in a, in, a, in, in a Western education, didn't see it that way. He thought everybody should be worthy. He once told me, he says, uh, he's being sarcastic, he says, you think the Chinese are the only ones who are virtuous and they have high standard of morality? You, he says, you, can't, you mean the other races don't have it? He says, and they said, that's BS. So he did a lot, he set my mind thinking. I was so happy because I said, oh, here's a Chinese that will teach another nine Chinese. Li loudly criticizes the more traditional forms of Chinese Kung Fu, referring to these styles as a classical mess, and boasts, to me, 99% of the whole business of Oriental self-defense is baloney. It looks good, but it doesn't work. The Chinese martial arts community is furious. They send a challenger, hoping to disgrace him. He had come into Bruce Lee's school in Chinatown, Oakland, and he says, I'm sent here by the uh, Chinese Kung Fu community. And he said, uh, you're to close your school down because we don't want you teaching non-Chinese. And Bruce Lee uh, told him, he says, uh, I'll teach anybody who I want to teach. So what, what it came down to is that he'd come in, he said, well, if you beat me, then you can teach non-Chinese. But if I beat you, you got to close your school down. <laughs> Lee chooses to fight in traditional Wing Chun fashion. He barely defeats his opponent. important things from that outcome. Number one, he was physically not where he could be in terms of cardiovascular and so on. And secondly, he realized that his arsenal was very, very limited. Lee begins to develop a new style of martial arts which he calls Jeet Kune Do, melding the mind, the body, and the spirit. Uh, water also is insubstantial. By that I mean you cannot grasp hold of it. You cannot punch it and hurt it. So every Kung Fu man is trying to do that. To be soft like water and flexible and adapt itself to the opponent. This is a crane form. Start off. The karate punch is like an iron bar. Whack. A Kung Fu punch is like an iron chain with an iron ball attached to the end and it go wang and it hurt inside. There is the finger jab, there is the punch, 
There is the back fist and then low. A guard stand, they use leg. Straight at the groin, all come up. Back in 1964, uh, my father had created um, a idea to have a, a, a tournament, an international karate tournament, to bring uh, groups of people, large groups of people from all over the world to compete uh, in, a, in a format so that they could dis display their different styles. And he thought this would be a wonderful opportunity to show this, this kid from Oakland off uh, in the public's eye. And his name was Bruce Lee. In this rare footage, he demonstrates his remarkable agility. Here it is again in slow motion. I remember my father many times talking about pound for pound, he was the best martial artist he'd ever seen. And he was uh, mesmerized by the speed and the agility and, and the effectiveness that, uh, that Bruce had. His uh, stage presence, his sense of humor, his um, confidence in himself had portrayed so well. He projected himself so well. William Dozier is dazzled by Lee at the International Karate Championships and hires him to play Kato on the Green Hornet. Everybody, I think, without exception in the martial arts community was, was uh, really a big fan of the Green Hornet simply because of Bruce. The Green Hornet is canceled after only one season, but the series spreads Bruce's reputation among world-class martial artists. What made Bruce really unique was the fact that he was learning from everyone. He wasn't stilted in the fact that this is the only way to do a, a martial art technique. He wanted to learn from everybody. And I was known for my kicks in those days. And so when he and I first started working out, the Chi Kune Do style was basically kicking below the waist. And that was his philosophy, was to kick below the waist, never bring your kicks above the waist. And I said, well, uh, true in a lot of respects, but it's nice to have the ability to kick anywhere. And as we started working out, his philosophy changed. He started emphasizing more uh, higher kicks, as you would notice on the he watched, screen. He studied and every boxer. He could kicks. imitate people like Walcott, you know, Judge Joe Walcott. He could imitate. So he really liked Muhammad Ali because of the, the uh, liveness of the footwork. Yeah, Bruce and I would talk about Muhammad Ali, and Bruce thought that his hand speed and his foot speed put him in another class, somebody that weighed 220 pounds, 215, 220 pounds. Bruce's uh, racial makeup made him open up to more than one concept as far as uh, how to live his life, and it crept into his, uh, into his art. Um, Jeet Kune Do is eclectic, uh, absolutely. Jeet Kune Do is American. It's not, it's not Asian. It's American. It's an eclectic uh, compilation of a lot of different fighting styles, and I think in that it's uniquely American although it borrows heavily from Asian fighting arts. Well, Jeet Kune Do uh, is, is, is uh, translated into uh, the way of the intercepting fist. Okay, Jeet means the intercept or stop, Kune means the fist, Do means the way. And really, and, uh, well, that's what he's trying to say. You have to, you have to really research your own experience. You have to really absorb what is useful for you what, and, what is, and reject what is not useful for you, but don't reject it unless you I was research very, it. Fortunate in that I had had no martial arts training before I met Bruce, just some boxing that my dad had taught me. So I, I didn't have a bias, and uh, I was open to whatever as long as it worked. And everything that Bruce taught me worked. <laughs> I've never seen any man really pound to pound anybody stronger than him. He does, you know, finger, you know, push up, two finger push ups. I, I cannot do it with four, although I do a thousand push ups with this, but I cannot do it with my finger. He was all over about 5'8". His reach was that of a six-footer. He had very long arms for a person 5'8". And then you, you can add to that incredible athletic skills, uh, balance, hand speed, foot speed, great eye-hand coordination, great timing. All of that driven by a very intense will and instinct. 
he had the ability to say, well, I'm arrogant, but I'll show you why. There's a reason for it. And it was, it was kind of a cockiness, the cockiness that I think all Americans kind of have inside of them, you know, to say, well, I, I can do it. I'm good. He's probably the most dynamic person I've ever met in my life. I mean, he could go from zero to uh, 140 miles an hour in no time at all. I mean, he'd be gone. He did the same thing to me uh, that he uh, did to James Coburn. What he did was he has this one-inch punch. He straightens out his arm like this, places it against your chest, and then, by some strange action, he just kind of twitches, and you go flying back about six feet. I hit the wall and fell off of the wall, fell down, and I thought to myself, what in the hell happened to me? How in the hell did I go flying back six feet, hit the wall, fall off, and fall down on the ground? I am the Pan American gold medalist for judo. How could this happen to we you? Were, we were working out of this big bag hanging out in uh, the, the patio of the, the place one day, and you know, a football tackling bag. And it was, uh, it was there for me to practice my sidekick, running sidekick. And whenever we worked out, we worked out in this patio. And uh, I, was, I was trying to make the thing swing back and forth one day, and was just, no, 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 like this. And he went, whack! And that running side kick that hit me in a crossover, boom! And the bag had just disintegrated out in, in the, the uh, whole backyard was filled with old rags or whatever it was stuffed with, you know. That was, and uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't I mean, go in amazing. the ring with him. I wouldn't. I mean, he is that fast and that re effective. And especially his, his punching power. And I know anybody get hit with his punch, he'll be knocked out. In the 60s, after the Green Hornet, um, all of a sudden, everything just came to nothing, basically. And he was very disappointed. And uh, he tried, and he knew he's got you know, the charisma and the moves, the, everything. I mean, he's got the talent to, to make it work. Following the cancellation of the Green Hornet, Lee's career in Hollywood stalls. He opens a Jeet Kune Do school in Los Angeles. His reputation brings in a flock of celebrity students, among them Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, James Coburn, James Garner, and Steve McQueen. He liked both Col Colburn and McQueen out of the movie people. Uh, I mean, that's not to say he didn't like Franciscus, no, and, right? But he liked McQueen because McQueen was physical. You know, he motorcycles and he can drive cars. And he liked James Colburn because James, he said, was philosophical. And he understood. He says, now if you could put these two guys together, <laughs> this is what he told me, he says, you would have a pretty good martial arts. Both of them big because competitors. You know, Steve was the, you know, like the most competitive cat I've ever met in my life. Steve. And very egotistical. <clears throat> wanted what Bruce had. Bruce wanted what Steve had. Steve was the number one box office. He was the king in, in his time. And Bruce was this incredible martial artist. Steve wanted to do that. He wanted to be that. It, it drove him. Bruce wanted to be the number one box office. And the, the two of them, they had this thing, and they were always kibitzing, always bantering back and forth. He wanted to achieve uh, that, uh, the goal of making more money than Steve McQueen. I know that was that really... <laughs> That really uh, would get to him when Steve would make more money than he did. By 1967, Bruce and Linda have two children, Brandon and Shannon. Linda provides tremendous support for her husband during this difficult period. She was a good combination of, a, of an Oriental and a, a Western bride. She, uh, she understood Bruce from uh, a point of view that probably none of us ever did. I kind of saw Linda as his anchor. I mean, she was there. She, she really made home uh, a sanctuary. And she was, was a calming uh, influence, and she understood him. And so a combination of the two made it over. I also think Bruce had a problem trusting a lot of people, but one person he really trusted was Linda. And I think that was the real thing that held him tight. Bruce definitely felt that uh, racial stereotypes worked against him in Hollywood. He had a lot to overcome trying to be uh, a male lead in an action 
film that wasn't Chinese. Uh, that, that was very difficult thing for him to well, deal with. I don't think with. there's any doubt and, he was uh, he went uh, discriminated against, that he faced tremendous prejudice in Hollywood, that he was not accepted uh, on the basis of talent, but rather they looked at him and said, oh, the Chinese guy, we don't need a Chinese guy today. And they didn't understand that there was so much more there, that he had so much more genius and talent and initiative and creativity. So uh, Bruce was very upset. He said, well, I, I'm just doing what I'm doing best at. And that's what supposedly is what the producers and directors want. But why would they turn me away? He was very upset, you know, so, and I can see why. Bruce was using the martial arts as a stepping stone to a movie career. He uh, knew what he wanted to do as an actor. He tried it here in the States. He uh, tried out for the, uh, uh, you know, he did that TV series, The Green Hornet. Then he tried out for the Kung Fu series. And they picked David Carradine over Bruce, which, you know, uh, made Bruce quite angry. I think, I think Bruce, Bruce was too much for television. I mean, he was, he was bigger than television. And I told him, I said, listen, man, uh, go to Southeast Asia and make those Southeast Asia films for a while. I mean, that'll make you a, a star. You stay here and you're going to do television, uh, that'll, uh, you, you'll use up all of the technique, all of the things you'll be doing, you're repeating yourself over and over and over again. Uh, you'll use all of that up. And besides, you know, your acting technique, hone your acting technique, you know, get over there and work something. to Hong Kong in order to make uh, the big boss because he had become very disillusioned with uh, the progress he was making here in Hollywood and uh, he saw it as a stacked deck. That was his goal. He was going to go to Hong Kong, become a major star in Hong Kong, then come back to the States and be a major star here in the States, which he would have, would have happened, I'm sure. Golden Harvest signs into two pictures in Hong Kong. Unwilling to risk an entire film on Lee, they cast him in a supporting role in The Big Boss. The first scene filmed is a climactic fight sequence in the ice factory. Lee's on-screen presence is electrifying. The producers expand his part and make him the star of the film. Bruce begins to implement his own ideas and gets involved with all aspects of filmmaking, including script changes and camera angles on the set of The Big Boss. Bruce went back to Hong Kong, he became miraculously successful. I mean, he became like the Beatles, that overnight Bruce, hit in the uh, Far East. Well, Bruce they made it fast, okay. Um, in a few months um, since, I mean, after his first f f film success, uh, 
we heard about it, okay? Because my mother and I, we were still in the United States, okay? And we saw his films, and we, when we first went into the movie theaters, like, we didn't expect to see, you know, like, Caucasians, Afro, African Americans, Hispanics, name it. I mean, they were all there, and every time Bruce would uh, hit somebody or knock somebody down, they would all cheer and say, well, yeah, right on, brother, you know, and stuff like that. You know? <laughs> we were so surprised, you know, we were so happy for Unbelievable. him. Unbelievable. You, you know? could just imagine going anywhere with Elvis Presley, then that's how it was in Hong Kong. It was literally mobbed, and everybody called him Le Sulong. And, uh, I mean, he was just mobbed everywhere he went. He really couldn't stay anywhere. He had to keep moving all the time. The press dubs Bruce Lee the king of kung fu. After the big boss, everyone believes he is without doubt the toughest man in the world. Because of the numerous threats and challenges, Bob Baker quietly assumes the role of bodyguard. Fists of Fury, Lee's next film, smashes all box office records across Southeast Asia. In Singapore, showings have to be canceled because of massive traffic jams surrounding the movie theater. In China, um, every, every average Chinese man, especially the little guys, all, they all love Bruce because uh, he was proof that uh, they didn't have to take a lot of crap from, from bullets. I mean, they, you know, that's a common theme in, in Chinese uh, uh, culture. And, uh, Bruce underlined it for him and uh, made them feel good about it. Despite considerable resistance from the Hong Kong film community, Lee demands and gets total control of his next picture. He produces, writes, directs, and stars in Way of the Dragon. The fight scenes in Way of the Dragon were Bruce's first attempt at doing what he dreamed of doing in terms of choreography. He had never been given as much freedom, time, or money, actually, to do what he wanted to do. All that. But when so I got on the set, I found out that this guy had also really, something I hadn't been around before, had really studied theater and acting and uh, really knew cameras. He, he, I mean, he was a very intense man. So all of that gelled into a fight scene that, that had a lot of emotional content. I mean, he knew how to get everything that he had or you had out on screen. We shot the fight scene, the fight I, Bruce and I did in Return of the Dragon. We shot in the Colosseum in Rome. Remember, Bruce and I worked out together for three years, so we knew each other quite well. So we just kind of choreographed it verbally, and then we just got in there for three days and uh, just went at it and did the fight scene. And, and in three days, we shot the whole fight. I was very glad that Bruce made it look like two gladiators pitting their skill against each other, just like they did in Rome hundreds of years ago. Bruce's unique blend of action and humor make Way of the Dragon his most successful film to date. He dazzles his fans with dynamic moves and introduces an obscure weapon, the deadly nunchucks. Bruce was getting out of the martial arts mainstream. He was getting into film production. He was getting into a different world that uh, was very new to him. But he was learning very rapidly, you know, how to deal with it. And he was also seeing it as a potential out for him to get out of the martial arts and not only be identified as a martial artist. But at the same time, he began to get a little paranoid that as he became more famous, that people were not his friends, that they were coming after him for what they could get and that he was accepting that he had truly a unique ability, especially in the martial arts, 
because he had never seen anybody else that could do what he could do. So he was perceiving himself as very possibly being able to revolutionize the film industry in Hong Kong. So he suddenly began to have a lot of enemies who suddenly saw him as a threat. No longer as just someone who they could pay $75 a week and get him in the movies or $1,000, it didn't matter. Now here was a guy who was actually, in a way, a threat to their professional life, their business. Well, I don't know, Bruce Lee's and personality this, this when he was back on his own home turf and didn't have a lot of uh, foreigners in America to deal with, particularly people who had power in Hollywood and so forth, his personality was that of a bully. He barked at people and pushed them around and threatened their lives, and uh, he was an overbearing uh, bully. So uh, I think he was always playing the strong man to impress people, and uh, I don't think you'd get the impression uh, he was any pushover or he was a uh, slight or vulnerable. Or <laughs> I, I think uh, that wouldn't be the case. But the fact is, I don't care how strong you are, you're, you're just one man. And if you don't have a whole gang around you like Elvis developed carrying, uh, you know, uh, pistols in their, in their armpits and quick release holsters and stuff like that, you this are is vulnerable. my own conjecture. I think he was lonely for America. This is, this is my own thing, because he said he was, I think he enjoyed his stay here in America. As in Hong Kong, he wasn't quite sure who was his real friend. So he missed, uh, I think he missed the, like he would usually come on a Sunday down to, to the place where I taught in, in Chinatown. And he would teach, and I think he missed that. I said, well, have you been teaching anybody in Hong Kong? He said, I don't have time for that. He said, I don't have time with all the film work. He says, I don't have time. I have time to do my personal training, but as far as training other people. And I think he missed that because he liked the, I think he enjoyed the sharing. sharing he was the star. It was fun. It was fun to watch him go through this because I'd never seen him do that before. You know, he's always been, that's why I say he was very paranoid. I thought he was paranoid anyway about all of that, and yet, yet there was a, the side, the joyful side of Bruce that I always enjoyed. Here in America, had seemed to disappear. offended by what he did. You have to I go back and remember is. what kind of guy Bruce was. If he didn't like your traditional method, he told you so, and he didn't care if he was on television or on top of the Empire State Building. He said what he thought, and he often got into arguments with people. And particularly in the Orient, the martial arts are taken as seriously. As, as, as a minister here would take his religion or a rabbi. I mean, it's a very, very important thing to him. And the martial arts represented very traditional forms. And those traditional forms had been done over hundreds and thousands of years. Now along comes Bruce Lee and says, I'm going to take a little bit of this form and a little bit of that form and mix it with some kickboxing from Thailand and with some American boxing. And I'm going to use this and that. And I'm going to shorten my strokes and I'm going to do this and that. And I'll call it Jeet Kune Do. And I know better than all of you who studied for thousands of years and hundreds of millions of kids around the world are going to follow me. Now, you can imagine, that's like saying to the Catholic, I'm going to take a little Catholicism and a little Judaism and a little Buddhism and start my own religion. Doesn't go over real well with the establishment. I have no direct information on Bruce Lee's involvement with any criminal elements whatsoever, but uh, from what I understand of the way things are done in Hong Kong, it would be pretty hard to avoid it. You know, even in American movie making, uh, the mafia has uh, put its stamp on the business many times, and it would be hard to believe over there that uh, they wouldn't try and get a grip on a, on a star of his caliber. There were, whether you call them triads or mobsters or organized crime, that uh, they came to Bruce in a number of different ways and essentially said, you play ball with us, uh, occasionally we'll want you to do something, uh, we want to skim a little money off certain projects you're involved with, and Bruce refused to play ball with them. Oh, he'd gotten very cocky. I mean, he'd, I mean he was strutting, is, I think is the best word for it. I mean, he, I mean, he's still nice enough. I mean, he was still... Uh, but he, he had gotten a sense of himself, and he had... Um, I guess it wasn't as totally gracious as one would have Wife, beautiful hoped. Children, uh, yeah, but, um, uh, I mean, he just had it all, and uh, some people resent that. Um, Bruce was uh, not bashful. He was quick to tell anybody what he thought. So he offended a few people, and I think particularly he offended some people in the media. As time went on, he had fewer and fewer friends, 
and a whole lot more fans. Uh, and that kind of bewildered him. And because some of the people who had been friends had become real strange. Uh, his success made them change. He didn't change. And, and certain people, he, he was really disappointed in. And, uh, people trying to use him, people trying to take advantage of the thought, fact that I they knew him. About it. Knowing uh, Bruce like I knew was, him, uh, I, I really feel like that he, he made some people uh, angry at what he did when he went to Hong Kong and he was quite successful. And of course, the thing about Bruce, uh, when, he w when he went to Hong Kong, he didn't go in with humility. He went in with uh, rough shoes. He was quite successful, and he didn't mind telling anybody about it that challenged him uh, locally or on TV. Or He had many, many conflicts with the powers that be over there. Knowing what I know, I lived in Japan for over a year, a year and a half. Uh, I know a lot of the things about the Asian ways. and some that's an, It's a very ancient race. And uh, they have ways to uh, inflict uh, uh, restitution that a lot of people don't understand. Chemicals, Once Bruce uh, made it, he, he really didn't have any more dragons to slay. He got the uh, popularity that he deserved and the appreciation for what he was doing in the martial arts. And um, he was so young, he was like 30 years old, and these things were happening to him. Um, he really had a hard time figuring out what to do next. Uh, I remember once he speculated, I, I might have to retire because I can't keep hitting these home runs. Lee begins shooting fights for his fourth film. In Game of Death, Lee fakes his own death to save his girlfriend from gangsters. The concept that he drew, there was a pagoda and there was five stories. The first group is guarded by 50 karate men and he gets through the first group. The second group is guarded by a, a, a gung fu man five Kung Fu men, and I forgot what the styles were. And then the third floor was supposed to be either Praying Mantis or Wing Chun. And then there was a next floor, which was my floor, which was supposed to be the Eskrima and Kali. And he'd work himself all the way up. The last floor is the floor of the unknown, and that's supposed to be Jabbar, the style of the unknown, and that's the last guy. Summer '72, and Bruce called me and asked me if I wanted to be in this film. He, he called, uh, looking for me, and they, he got my number. And we had three weeks between when school ended, and I had to go to training camp for the NBA. So uh, he said, "Come on over. We'll we'll shoot. Uh, I have a, a scene. I have several scenes all mapped out, and." Uh, the set has already been built. We can knock this out in, a, in about 10 days. So that's, uh, that's all it took. And I flew over there and we did it. Um, we didn't even have any uh, working agreement. I, <laughs> I just, uh, we did the film and he said we'd uh, get the uh, particulars worked out later.
Bruce intends Game of Death to be a philosophical film mirroring his own personal quest for perfection. He works obsessively on his fourth physically demanding film in 13 months. He is losing weight and never seems to rest. Publicly, he preaches fluidity and relaxation, but in private, he is becoming increasingly agitated, impatient, and inflexible. As soon as he had finished making the first film, which was The Big Boss, um, he sent it to me. Uh, I, when I had seen the film, scheduled a screening over at the chairman of Warner Brothers, Ted Ashley, uh, and we went to his house and saw the film, and he flipped over it all. So I said, why don't we write a script now for this artist? He's doing fantastic. The money will be gotten back out of the uh, Far East and Hong Kong and Taiwan. And uh, so it was decided to go ahead and try to do something with it. Uh, a script was written, and uh, eventually I went over to Hong Kong, and uh, a deal was made between Golden Harvest, Raymond Chow, his company, and um, Warner Brothers. And that was the picture called Into the Dragon. It was uh, stressful at stages because I think Bruce was uh, very nervous about doing this big film. It was his first international film with a big budget. And so that was a little stressful watching the stress Bruce put himself under. And, and, uh, but it was interesting watching how Fred handled Bruce and how Paul Heller handled him. Bruce was so nervous, he didn't want to, he, he didn't want to start. He was just afraid that it wasn't going to work well. And uh, he, for him, it was, he had a great deal at stake. I mean, this was his first starring role in an international film, all English film whatever and it was his the weight of it rested on his shoulders and he was he, bruce was very bright i mean he he understood all that it implied he first when we started the film he didn't show up for a while and uh, for the first week or two it was hard finding i was shooting everything but bruce lee in this film and reporting back to warner brothers everything's going fine but i couldn't send him any film yet on bruce lee he had sort of gotten cold feet the first scene that he did in the studio he was so nervous and so physically shaking. We shot the scene where he's sitting down in a chair and they had just sort of turned his head. It's the only action we gave him in that first scene and managed to get through it. It was a little bit shaky. We really worked hard with Bruce, but Bruce knew what he wanted in the fights. But as time went on, um, he, he became more and more difficult. And I think it was because he had this enormous energy. Bruce was never tired on the set. I saw him work uh, tirelessly, and uh, it was, uh, he knew exactly what he wanted when it came to the fights. He worked at his trade and such all the time. Uh, he, seemed, he seemed not to sleep, and uh, he would call at midnight or one o'clock in the morning and say, hey, I've got an idea for a change in the script. Meet me at so-and-so restaurant. So I wasn't getting any sleep, and, uh, but he didn't seem to need it. Believe me, all five of Bruce's films were Bruce Lee films. He really put his stamp on them. He controlled it, and he absolutely made sure that all the all the fight scenes, all the action scenes, were done the way he wanted them. Period. Amen. He uh, also worked out fight scenes, um, drawing little stick figures, which he was very good at, and uh, he would uh, choreograph the entire fight on paper with little stick figures and uh, very easy to follow and uh, he was extremely inventive in, in uh, the fight sequences and, and the approach to fighting and, uh, and meticulous and he uh, and he wanted to be extremely accurate to create an illusion within an illusion 8,000 mirrors are brought in to form a set the cinematographer plans to film the violent but ballet-like action of Bruce Lee in slow motion to give the scene a new dimension. It is very difficult for the director to confine the movement between the actor and the mirrors to hide all possible reflections of camera and lights. It will take hours of coordination and planning before Robert Klaus and Bruce Lee are set to begin.
there were unbelievable differences between making a film in Hollywood and making a film in Hong Kong. I mean, um, they would rent the set, and every night they would set, send the set, the set back. In other words, they rented a couch, and then the next day they would come back and, and they would have a different couch, a different color. And I said, where's the couch we had yesterday? We had to finish the scene. And they said, oh, they sold it. I mean, that was the kind of problems that occurred. There was, a, for instance, a wonderful scene at the end of the movie where we have all the martial artists in white fighting against the martial artists in the black outfits. And what had happened, it took a couple of days to shoot that big scene. And of course, I got there early in the morning, and um, all the white outfits were gone. And I said, where are all the white outfits? And the, the costume were from Hong Kong. said, oh, they were very dirty. We sent them to the cleaners. And I said, well, we need them. He said, well, they were at the cleaners. We got into trucks. We ran down. The, we had all these wet white suits that we had to put on all the extras. And of course, that was just one of a thousand little things that occurred. We, we were going to shoot a boat scene. And we got to the boat, and we said to the man, today was the day we, we arranged for the boat. He said, you can't have the boat today. And I said, but today's the day we arranged. And he said, no, you can't have the boat. And I figured, well, maybe it's because I have to give him a little bit more money or something. Had nothing to do with that. He was just a very superstitious. He said, if you want this picture to be successful, do not take the boat out today. And there was no way I could talk to him or talk him into it. We shot around it and shot, came back a day later shot that scene and several shot the times, boat. Eight times to be exact, the uh, particular just... scene with the broken bottles. Each time we'd shoot the scene, I'd have to break the real bottles. Uh, and Bruce instructed me to take the jagged edge of my right hand, which I had one in each hand, but lunge with the right hand at his right pec. And Bruce's words were, come at me as fast as you can. So on the sixth time that we shot it, Bruce had his right hand up and he'd started to spin. And as he spinned, he jammed his fist into the glass. And so Freddie Weintraub called me and said, you know, uh, there's a rumor that Bruce is going to kill you. And uh, I went back after his hand was well and we shot the rest of the scene where he sidekicks me. And he sidekicked me so hard. I mean, Bruce hit like a mule. Um, that in, in one of the scenes when he, he hit me, uh, I flew back and one of the stuntmen behind me, his arms got broken from the impact. Um, he, I hit him so hard he fell into Bob a chair. Bob was as ready so for Bruce it as anybody could be, but Bruce, when the time came, and we had about three cameras all going high speed, Bob went flying. He went, he must have gone 30 feet through, through the chairs, through everything. And he was he was going to try to stonewall it. I mean, he was going to really just be there and stop Bruce dead. So Bruce hit me it. hard. Well, in that scene, I'm pretending I'm groggy, and all Bruce had to do was come up and kick me in the face or in the neck, and I'd have been in serious trouble. Well, clearly he didn't do that. And uh, so there really was no problem between Bruce and I. Um, it was just, I mean, I felt terrible then, and I feel terrible 20 years later that, that he got hurt. But it wasn't a... a, a a threatening, a life-threatening injury by any means. It was just an unfortunate accident. On the 14th of February, 1972, producer Fred Weintraub wrote to his family, Bruce Lee has been fantastic. He is the hardest worker, always on time, no problems, a real Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I've become a mean son of a bitch. At first, I leaned over backwards to get things done the Chinese way. Now, I find by yelling and screaming, it works a little better. That bullshit about the Chinese way has seen its last day. Part of my enthusiasm is coming from the great competition among the martial artists, everyone trying to outdo the other. I must admit, Bruce is far superior to any of them. Today, an extra challenged him just like the Old West, 
and he literally wiped the floor with him. He was being challenged all the time. And they would go ahead and the, the, the Chinese men would walk up to Bruce and they would tap three times with their foot and cross their arms. It was like a challenge. And Bruce would walk over, he's gonna fight with them, right? I said, Bruce, we gotta do the film. He said, wait, let me take care of it. He go, pop, 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 and he knocked the guy. I said, Bruce, now look. Someone's going, you get hit? He said, no, don't worry, I'll take care of it. Sure enough, he knocked the guy right out. I used to watch him like a hawk because there were challenges all the time. Bob Wall also tells of a challenge he witnessed. The guy wound up jumping down, and, and he was uh, bigger than Bruce, pretty fair-sized guy. And it started, they, they started going at it, and it was soon evident that this guy was very good. He was, he was fast, he was strong, and, but he was definitely trying to hurt Bruce. Bruce opened up on him. And I mean, he kicked the hell out of this guy. He, he beat him up real good. He ran him into, the, into the, the base of the wall that he jumped off of and arm-locked him and knee-trapped him and, uh, and proceeded to bloody his face up, you know, pretty thoroughly. He made sure that the guy understood who was boss. And when he let him go, the guy didn't want any more. And, uh, and then Bruce just forgot about it. There was nothing. It's back up on the wall. So he didn't fire him. He wasn't vindictive, but he, he darn sure showed him who the boss was. So Bruce was... Uh, he was a very capable street fighter. But while these difficulties occurred on Enter the Dragon, and there were many, it was Linda who always came to me and said, he'll be there tomorrow. It was always Linda who came to me and said, he's, he's just take it easy, he'll be here in a day. There was a time when I was almost going to leave Hong Kong, when the picture I thought was never going to go forward. And I was going to leave that night, and Linda called me and said, Fred, it'll be all right. Linda was just fabulous. She had such a calming influence on Bruce and, and uh, was able to, you know, keep him comfortable about his work. Because Bruce was a perfectionist. He wanted everything perfect. And so I would say that Bruce Freddie had a problem and, and Linda trusting a lot of people, but one person he really trusted was Linda. And I think that was the real thing that held him tight, was Linda. Production ends on Enter the Dragon in late March, 1973. He knew by that time that the film was gonna be good. And he knew that he was destined for stardom. I mean, he'd ordered his Rolls Royce yeah, Corniche because so he knew it was feeling. gonna come. And I was excited. I knew it was gonna be a smash hit. It was just no question about it. I, I, in fact, my comment to Bruce was, you got magic in a bottle. I think it's gonna be a big hit. But he was still nervous about it when I left. Well, I mean, that, the intensity that marked his whole life. And I think in a way that, you know, the focus of it became even greater with the, this film that we did. And I think it was very hard for him to let down. I mean, it's, you know, he was on a high. He was on an incredible... Bruce anxiously awaits the release of Enter the Dragon, certain it will make him an international superstar. He returns to work on Game of Death. The Hong Kong press fans the flames of stardom by portraying him as a mystically empowered fighter. Many would-be masters challenge Lee through the media and even on the street. The Hong Kong film industry offers movie contracts to anyone who can defeat Bruce Lee. On the street, he'd get, it was like a shootout in the OK Corral. I mean, guys would come and they'd, they'd challenge him on the street. There was a thing where, you, you know, they stand there and they tap their foot and, and he's got to take up the challenge. And Bruce would mostly, because he, was, he knew he was better than they were, uh, would, you know, would ignore it, walk away from it. Sometimes he couldn't. And these guys would get hurt. I mean, these, these, these were fierce encounters. And uh, Bruce was, I think, the best of all of them. I mean, realistically, he was incredibly fast. He had, you know, timing reflexes that I defy anybody to this day to match. Time, but uh, Bruce related to me how one time one fellow got over that wall, got into his yard and challenged him. He says, how good are you? And Bruce is hopping mad, he said. And he just the idea of this guy would come and invade my home, my own private home, invade and challenge me. And he said he got so mad, and he gave that guy the hardest kick Hong he ever he gave anyone with in him. his life. He did it. And he became like the old Western gunfighter who was the fastest draw alive, that everybody was now looking at him like, can I beat him? May 10th, 1973, Lee collapses and is rushed to the hospital. Within hours, he makes an astonishing recovery. Lee had ingested hashish and is warned this could be a severe allergic reaction. The next time I saw him, he came back from Hong Kong after having that, uh, that whatever it was. He had the doctors check him out when he passed out that first time for, uh, you know, that half hour or so that he was gone. He told me that, that, that you know, once him. he'd been 
yeah. in the men's room in a restaurant and suddenly passed out. And I guess it had happened one other time. I'm not quite sure. And he came to me and he asked my advice, my advice, did I know a doctor? And I brought him to my doctor, who was a very eminent cardiologist and uh, internist. And after the examination, I mean, it, he didn't break any confidences other than to say that Bruce had the the body of a of a teenager, that he was incredibly fit. I would stay with him for about a couple of weeks, and uh, in fact, uh, he, he stepped on the scale and he said, look, look at my weight, and uh, he said, I'm 126 pounds, and look at me, I'm, I'm uh, you know, nothing but muscle and bones, and I'm, I'm feel good, I'm he strong. Said, he said, oh man, believe it or not, he, he said, you know, the doctor told me I got a body like an 18 year old. And I said, well, he was thin, but you know, he was still in good spirits. I walked in, he was staying at the Beverly Hills okay. Hotel, one of the bungalows, and when I walked in, he, he looked pale and gray, and, and, and looked like he'd lost 20 pounds, he looked very light. And um, uh, and he was he was repeating himself. Um, he told me on the phone a story, and then when I got there, he told me the same story, like he'd forgotten. He told me, and and so I felt I, when I first saw him, I said, "My God, Bruce, you and, know, uh, what's wrong with you?" And he said, Ju oh, "July 19th, he called me to tell me my movie is all edited, ready to go." <laughs> then next day, 24 hours later, I heard in the radio that, that Bruce Lee was dead. So I called Linda immediately. Is it true? Linda said, yes, June. It is true that he, he's gone. Sterling called. Oh, well, and he said, Bruce is dead. I said, come on, man. What are you talking about? I just talked to him on the phone a couple of days ago. He said, he died. Died this morning. It's in all the papers. On the... On the <sighs> you know, that... It's just, whoa took all of that energy. It was an unreal situation. It was not like someone who was in an accident or someone who, who was old or someone that you expected. You just, it was like a piece of, of, uh, of energy had just left the planet. It was hard to believe. It was hard to believe that, that, uh, that he had died. I, I thought it was some kind of strange publicity, uh, Maneuver that uh, some that there was a mistake. Um, it's really devastating, and especially when someone that you consider to be invincible dies. Um, gives it makes you pause and uh, think about a few things. On July twentieth, nineteen seventy-three, Lee visits actress Betty Tingpei. He complains of a headache and decides to nap. Betty gives him a single equagesic pill. When she can't wake Bruce two hours later, Betty calls a doctor. Bruce is taken to the hospital where he's pronounced dead on arrival. Bruce Lee's funeral is the largest ever held in Hong Kong. There is a subsequent whirlwind of rumors. It didn't look like Bruce lying there, did it? No. It looked like, you know, it, it looked like a mask of Bruce Lee, painted almost. But it certainly didn't look like Bruce. I saw him in that was... casket uh, before the services. I broke down and I actually cried. And that's the first time I believe I've cried for... Even when my father died, I didn't cry. But when Bruce died, it was like a nice part of me going... Okay, when we first got to Seattle, my mother and I and, and my sister, Phoebe, uh, we went... To, the first time we went to the, to the funeral parlor, um, saw the casket, open casket. My mother went over there, grabbed the casket and just wouldn't let go. She started crying and yelling and screaming. And so finally, she, you know, we were trying to just get her out. And um, again, she collapsed. So finally, Linda had to hire a nurse to take care of her. You know, just, just couldn't, couldn't accept it. And after Bruce's death, you know, she's been affected. Every time we talk about Bruce, you have tears in her eyes. You know, it's terrible. Over 100 newspapers scavenge for information. Rumors are piled on top of rumors and taken for fact. The Chinese newspapers love to play up all sorts of mystery and intrigue and how the Zen masters used secret potions to destroy him and because they were also very competitive. And I, I guess he was very ready to lord it over the rest of them. 
about how superior he was. And then, of course, there were endless rumors about uh, whether the cannabis in his stomach meant that he uh, had died because of a drug overdose or whether there was some other mysterious illness or whether uh, some uh, person in the Orient who had some drug that's unknown in the West had slipped this to him or uh, the vibrating palm theory that somebody had walked up to him and used a secret death touch. The whole story is I met this Baptist minister who was a doctor and who was Bruce Lee's personal physician. And this guy told me what I still believe was the cause of Bruce Lee's death, that he had an allergy to hashish and his brain swelled when he smoked it and pressed against his skull and that they had barely saved his life once and it happened again and this time he was in a woman's apartment with whom he was having an affair and nobody could get to him in time. And uh, I feel, I really feel he's assassinated. It's always been my viewpoint. And even at the time he died, remember there was a great deal of controversy uh, even then about whether he might not have been killed by other Chinese, possibly the mafia, possibly another uh, martial arts group who were offended by what, what happened to him was to that kind of in the final uh, months of his life, he became so emotionally agitated over whatever it was he was involved in, let's call it movie making, that uh, he began to um, uh, lose control of himself. And um, he discovered that taking uh, hashish had a calming effect on him. You get that energy this going, so and that energy has to be used up or it's going to use you up. And I, that may be what happened to Bruce. Maybe that's what it was that caused that thing, because he, he did have that, that way of uh, arriving at himself with that incredible energy. But I think ultimately that he let himself go physically and that it cost him his life. Tissue samples were examined by doctors in Hong Kong, Australia, and New Zealand. Dr. Lysette in Hong Kong said there were no visible injuries to bruise his skull. None of the vessels in the brain were blocked or broken, even though he suffered from cerebral edema or brain swelling. Dr. Tier, professor of forensic medicine at the University of London and an expert who had carried out over 90,000 autopsies, was flown in to examine the body. He believed the only feasible cause of death was hypersensitivity to the iquagesic, however unusual and rare this case might be. The inquest jury returned a verdict. It was not accidental, but death by misadventure. Enter the Dragon is released three and a half weeks after Bruce's tragic death. He becomes the first Asian superstar in the world. The legend of Bruce Lee is born. I sat with Linda uh, at the Groundman's Chinese when we first saw the first playing of Enter the Dragon. And uh, Bruce had just died three weeks before. And boy, that was one of the hardest moments that I can ever remember. But in a way, she was part of the art and she was part of what we saw on the screen that night. And I was at least pleased that she was there to see what had happened. Brandon Lee struggled in the shadow of his famous father, but he came to terms with the legacy of Bruce Lee when he turned down a major role in the film Dragon, the Bruce Lee Story. I feel that I've gotten opportunities that I probably would not have gotten, or at least in a different fashion would have gotten, were I not his son. And I'm very grateful for that, you know? But as far as following his footsteps go, if one means by that, would I like to achieve the same level of excellence that he did? Yes, of course I would, in any field, you know? But does it mean that I want to imitate him in any way, shape, or form? No, because imitation is, it's, it's pale, you know? It's not, uh, it's not good. And besides which, we're just different people. I mean, we, we, we grew up under very different circumstances and in, in different countries, speaking different languages, you know, reading different books, dating different women, and doing everything differently. So that's how I feel about it. On March 31st, 1993, Brandon Bruce Lee was killed on the set of the motion picture The Crow in Wilmington, North Carolina. Brandon was accidentally shot 
when a bullet was fired from a 44 caliber handgun that was supposed to have contained blanks. Even in death, Brandon could not escape the shadow of his father. Four weeks ago today, the spirit of the father that shone so brightly through the sun was tragically extinguished. I feel I represent Bruce here today, and if he were here today, he would want to say to the film community that this must never happen again. And so I am calling for a positive call for action to the film community as individuals and collectively to take measures that the safety precautions that they have on their film sets will never lead to this series of negligent acts that took the life of my son. The I say these things, I say these things on the behalf of Brandon's father and myself, and on behalf of his sister Shannon and his fiance Eliza, and all of the extended family and friends of Bruce and Brandon Lee. We expect that a young life will not be wasted in vain. Brandon was such a, I don't know, I would say a pussycat. Brandon was just a wonderful boy. I mean, I, I, I know Brandon, um, uh, he was the same age as my son. And uh, Linda brought him over when he grew up and he wanted to be an actor. And he really wanted to be an actor. And, and Linda had me talk him into go to college, you know, convince him, which I was trying to do with my son also, you know. And um, Brandon was just a gentleman. On May 2nd, 1993, the New York Times reported both father and son struggled to realize the American dream only to have death leave them on the verge of success. Like James Dean and Marilyn Monroe, whose celebrity seduced the public and whose premature death came as a shock, Bruce and Brandon Lee's immortality seem assured. Their films record the bittersweetness of promise unfulfilled. Entertainment Weekly reported... Within hours of Lee's shooting, an astonishing array of rumors were breathlessly circulated. Brandon Lee, it was said, was murdered by triads, a group of organized criminals. Others pointed to an uncanny similarity between Lee's killing and a scene in his father's final film, Game of Death, in which Bruce Lee's character, shooting a movie within a movie, gets hit by a real bullet while pretending to die of gunshot wounds. People magazine reported Bruce Lee's son Brandon was shot and killed as cameras rolled, sparking rumors of foul play and a family curse. Shortly before he died in 1973, Bruce Lee bought a house in a Hong Kong suburb called Kowloon Tong, incurring, as the legend has it, the jealous wrath of the neighborhood's resident demons. Robert Lee told Inside Kung Fu, Our family believes Bruce was murdered. They believe Bruce's passing 20 years ago was no accident, no death by misadventure. On April 28, 1993, 20 years after his death, a Bruce Lee star was unveiled on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Bruce Lee was a man of vision. He's being honored here today for his work in film and television, but he blazed trails in other areas as well. He was an avid student and teacher of philosophy and martial arts, and he respected tradition. However, he was not bound by tradition, and in doing that, he inspired others to search for and find their own potential in life. Bruce Lee was also a man of action, one of his favorite quotes was, knowing is not enough, we must apply. By that he meant, it's great to le learn knowledge, to study and everything, but if you don't do anything with it, it's useless. And then he said, 
willing is not enough, we must do. By which he meant that it's fine to wish for things, to want for things, to hope and to dream, but if you don't do anything about realizing your dreams, they're not going to happen. Jean-Claude Van Damme, ladies and gentlemen. I just came here today to pay respect to a guy who loves life like crazy. And I'll talk to you soon, Bruce. The tenets of Bruce's philosophy and art continue to flourish today as evidenced by the re-release of his films to subsequent generations. Posters of Bruce hang in every martial arts school around the world. Twenty years later, the legacy of Bruce Lee still lives. I think Bruce saw life as I do, not in years. You know, you could live to be 80 years old and never accomplish anything in your life. And what have you gained? Where in his short period of life of 32 years, he had gained, he had achieved a lot in his life. Lost, but the great human being was lost from this planet. That's the first thing in my mind. Uh -huh. And how unfair it is to really take this, this man's life away. Yeah. And so early, and he has so much to do for martial art and for humanity. I don't think there'll ever be another Bruce Lee. Uh, certainly not in the pure tradition that he that he uh, that he discovered and that he invented and that he performed so brilliantly. The character of Bruce Lee becomes, I mean, he, he, he grows enormously and begins to live outside of time, outside of space, outside of language. And uh, it's, it's um, uh, because he's no longer here, all we hear are the, is the plaintive uh, uh, call of his ghost to, to remember him. And we do, obediently. I've uh, emulated him a lot in how I live my life, you know, and some of the things I try to teach my kids. And I think uh, having studied with uh, Bruce Lee and John Wooden, at, at the same time in, in, in my life puts me uh, in a very unique uh, category and uh, I, I appreciate what I learned from both of those wonderful men. I had been in the internment camps uh, uh, for about five or six years and came out and, and I was just a derelict. I, I couldn't, I lost all my pride and self-respect and uh, when I met Bruce he he told me that, that I was just as good as anybody else and not any better, but just as good. And of course, I didn't believe him at first, but by working out and, and getting the philosophy that he had to go along with the physical part of it, um, it kind of restored my whole, whole faith in, in what, I, what, I, what, what I was here for. Bruce was the excitement that could happen to every person if they really dedicated themselves. Uh, I think when you look at that wonderful scene with him and Kareem, in which Kareem is so big, and he, he, he looks up at him, and you see that look on his face. I think that look on his face is what every, everybody thinks of um, about the possibility of achieving greatness. You know, that man will never grow old. He'll always be young. <laughs>